have you ever considered what type of diagnostic process you use? You know, it really doesn't matter if you're trying to solve a check engine light complaint or you're going after the cause of a noise vibration harshness problem or really any other kind of problem that your customer presents you with that requires some type of troubleshooting. If you follow a logical step-by-step -step process, no matter what the situation might be, you'll find yourself arriving at answers and ultimately repairing the problem a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. And so that's the topic for today's edition of The Trainer, the diagnostic process. You know, I've heard the diagnostic process uh, explained by some top instructors in a variety of ways, but they all tend to follow a similar outline, a similar progression, if you will. So let's follow along and let me see if I can share with you my concept of a diagnostic process and how you can apply that to the troubleshooting situations that you face. And then we'll continue building on this uh, series that we're doing, ultimately to help you solve more of those drivability complaints that your customers are bringing you. So let's start with step one. Let's all think of this as, as being detectives and we're, at this, and we're trying to solve a crime. The crime is that problem that the customer has presented us with, that uh, whatever is causing the car to act up in a way that we don't like and the customer doesn't like. Again, we could be a check engine light that's on, the car's not running properly, maybe it's got a noise, maybe it's got a harsh ride, whatever the case might be, we can apply these steps to solving that crime, solving that problem, finding out who that perpetrator is. So let's think of those kind of terms as we go forward. First step is determine what crime has actually been committed. You know, a lot of times people will see something happen and they will go back to report it to the authorities and they all have different versions of what it was that occurred. So we don't really know exactly what type of crime has been committed yet, right? We don't know exactly what type of problem that we're looking to tra track down. So the very first thing we want to do is verify that customer's complaint. We want to spend time talking to the customer or have our service advisor talk to that customer and find out exactly what it is that you're concerned about. What exactly is the complaint that you're bringing to us to repair? Very important to interview the customer, get as much information as you can, and get the information from the driver of the car. You know, all too often, uh, say uh, the husband's going to work, so he has the wife drop off the car to have something looked at, but the wife doesn't drive her husband's car. She drives her car. So she's not used to exactly what that problem is or what the symptoms might be. You've got to talk to the person who's experienced the problem. This would be just like standing in front of Judge Judy and getting that secondhand information, right? That's information, that's testimony we can't allow in the court because it's hearsay. There's no practice, they don't know for themselves what the facts are. So you got to talk to the person who drives the car. If necessary, then we're going to go drive the car. We're going to try to see if we can duplicate the conditions under which this customer is complaining about this problem. It may just be that the check engine light's on, so it's going to be a short test drive, but if we're dealing with some type of a ride quality issue, then we need to duplicate that, that issue. Where's that problem occurring? Is it at low speeds? Is it in turns? Is it cruising? Whatever the case might be. And then, of course, if we're dealing with a, a drivability complaint, then we want to check for codes. Uh, we want to see exactly what the computer is telling us, and that's a pretty good witness because that's the one doing the test, right? We talked about that early in the series. That ultimately, if we're dealing with that check engine light complaint, that ultimately is the individual that we have to satisfy. That's going to be our jury that we're going to have to provide our evidence to and correct that problem to make sure that, that indeed it's fixed because the jury is going to tell us whether we got that correct or not, right? The ECM. All right, so let's move on to step two. Now it's time as good investigators to gather evidence about whatever concern we've now isolated, that what we're tackling, what we're going after. Again, it starts with that customer interview. Same time that process is going on, we're going to try to pull as much information from the customer as we can about the circumstances surrounding when they uh, feel that complaint, when it's a concern for them. Test drive is also part of that gathering evidence. It's not just to verify the complaint, but it's also to get a feel for ourselves when that problem is occurring so that as we go through the repair process, we can duplicate that complaint, we can duplicate that concern, and ultimately verify that we fixed it. Visual inspection is one of the first things that I do when the vehicle comes back into the bay. I like to look at it all from stem to stern, under the hood, under the car, what kind of shape are the tires in, what kind of shape is the oil in, and what I'm looking for is how well does this person take care of the car? 
because there are a lot of things that come along or problems that come along that are just caused by lack of maintenance or abuse or neglect. So I'm going to get a feel. Is this someone that, that takes very good care of their car, their car is immaculate, or is this thing not seen an oil change since the day it left the showroom floor? You know, you're with me. You guys have seen it every single day in your shops. I want to get a feel for that. I also want to look for anything obvious. Uh, is there hoses unplugged? Is there signs of wiring damage? Uh, is the harness too tight in areas? Little things like this that are all kind of focused on the evidence I'm trying to collect for the crime that I'm investigating. You with me? So these are some of the things you're going to look at. If I'm dealing with a noise, vibration, harshness issue, what kind of shape are the tires in? What kind of shape is the, the suspension and, and uh, steering components in? These are all things where I'm going to focus on the visual inspection. If I am going after, <coughs> excuse me, if I am going after a check engine light, then absolutely I need to check the freeze frame data. Uh, we talked about this as well when we went through the modes of OBD2. If I'm dealing with a continuous monitor, that's misfire, fuel, and comprehensive component, it's critical that I understand the conditions under which that problem was seen by the control module, by the engine control module. Was that misfire occurring at idle? Was it at cruise? Was it under load? Was it uh, just coming downhill? Whatever the case might be, cold, hot, uh, what speeds, what RPM. These are all little bits of information that I want. And remember what I said before, when I go to pull those codes early on, I'm not erasing anything. I'm not clearing anything because I'm going to wipe out a lot of information that I still need. Uh, as my friend G. Trulia says, that's like pouring bleach on the crime scene. Once I hit that key and clear that code, I'm going to wipe out the freeze frame. I'm going to reset monitors. I'm going to clear out a lot of information that I might need. So I'm going to pull that out first, and then I'm going to snapshot it, print it, take a picture of it with my camera, whatever I need to do to preserve that evidence for later use, right? And then finally, sometimes I'll go into mode six, depends on what it is that I'm looking for. It might be a catalytic converter issue, it might be a misfire issue on a, say pre-can Fords or even some of the later model, uh, any can vehicle, I might go there for information. But again, at this stage, I'm trying to look for as much as I can get. I'm leaving no stone unturned, pulling all that evidence together so that when I uh, get that all done, I can sit back and review it all and start making some conclusions, which leads me to step three. I'm gonna research the facts next. Now that I have all this evidence, I need to understand how they tie together. Uh, I wanna make sure that I look at uh, any technical service bulletins that might have been released by the factory. That's one of the very first places that I go. Anything that's similar, but let me tell you something here. I'm not looking for a silver bullet. Uh, we all know there are pattern failures. We all know that there are common failures. Uh, but just because the vehicle that's in front of you today has the exact same symptoms as the last four before it doesn't mean that this is the fifth same fault. Yes, you can test for that, you can verify that, and then proceed with that. That's all part of the gathering evidence and researching the information. But don't just automatically shotgun that part at it because the last four cars used the same fix. That fifth one may not be on the same line. Um, I'm going to check and read up on system operation. I want to make sure that I'm very familiar with whatever systems that I'm going to be looking at, that I'm going to be troubleshooting. Uh, just because I'm familiar with Ford fuel systems, for uh, instance, doesn't mean that the Ford model in my bay today does it the same way that the Ford model did yesterday. And certainly, if it's a different brand altogether, nobody do does the same thing anymore. You have to make sure you understand how that system operates. Uh, I'm going to read up, if I find any codes, I'm going to read up on whatever the setting requirements and the enabling criteria for those codes are. What exactly does that ECM want to see before it records that fault, before it sets that code? What criteria is involved? What other codes are going to be suspended in their testing while this code is active? That could lead me to so, uh, troubles uh, when I'm all done. If I fix the problem at hand, but I don't rerun the test to recheck for those codes that have been suspended, the customer may, may come back with that check engine light on, but for a totally different problem. Will the customer care? No, the customer's back. All he knows or she knows is that I had to come back with the same problem, my check engine light's on, whether the cause is different or not. So we want to make sure that we check that, and as part of our repair process, we, we run all the monitors to completion so we can make sure that there isn't anything hiding there that's going to come back and bite us later. I'm going to take a look at any related troubleshooting flow charts for the codes. And let me, let me clarify that too. I'm not a big fan of flow charts, not for use. And I'll tell you why. First, it's human nature to be in a hurry. We want to get things done. 
So sometimes we're going to make assumptions following that flow chart, don't we? And admit it, we've all done this. We start on step one, we do step two, but we've got three pages of trouble chart here. So we know that, oh, well, we, I know three is okay and four is okay and five is okay. I'm going to skip down to 10 and then proceed. And next thing you know, you, you've jumped over the issue, you didn't catch it, and you complete the flow chart, and you still aren't any closer to solving the problem than you were when you started. The other thing that bothers me with flow charts is uh, randomly using that, but you're not understanding why you're making a particular test. What is the role of the component in the system that you're testing? How does that affect the code that you're trying to solve? If you don't know that, the test results you're gonna get may mean nothing to you, but to the more experienced tech, the tech who did his homework, who researched the data, gathered the evidence, is gonna look at that same reading and go, that's the problem. So make sure that if you're going to use the flow chart, it's good for reference, it's good for gathering information to understand how the system works, what you're going to be troubleshooting, what component and other systems may be involved. So I, I use it for that information at first. Um, no problem with checking for potential pattern failures. Like I said, I'm not looking for silver bullets, but as part of my early research, if I find out that 300 other technicians have the same problem that I do, I'm at least going to test for that and verify if that is a potential problem. It's going to definitely go on my list of suspects, and there's some great resources for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, IATN, of course, has been around a very long time. Identifix, uh, a lot of service information like Mitchell Sure Tracker out there, and I have no problem if you even Google, <laughs> excuse me, looking for these answers. Uh, but I will tell you this, make sure you know the source of your information when you do uh, go on the internet, when you do a broad Google search. There's a lot of so-called industry experts out there that are nothing of the kind. So make sure you stick with the resource that you absolutely know and trust rather than just relying on, on what uh, Car Guy 24 says is the problem, right? Okay. Step four, now that we've got all this information, it's time to assemble our suspects. What do I mean by that? I'm gonna take a look at all the information I've gathered so far. And I'm going to start thinking to myself, okay, with everything that I know to this point, I know the symptoms of the problem. I know what, what, what is required to set the code. I know what's required to, uh, um, what the criterion are for the code. Uh, and I know what kind of shape the car is. And I've done the visual inspection, haven't found anything obvious. But knowing what I know, I can start writing down potential suspects, potential problems that I think may be causing this. Uh, it could be, for example, um, there's an open in the wire uh, leading to the oxygen sensor heater. Uh, the internal heater core, uh, resistor could be bad in the oxygen sensor. Um, there could be a vacuum leak. There could be a restriction in the exhaust. Whatever those things might be, again, dependent on the, the issue that you're trying to troubleshoot. And we're going to explore these in more detail as this series progresses and we actually uh, uh, progresses and we actually start looking at vehicles with specific problems to show you what I mean by this a little more clear but I hope you're getting what I'm saying here. I'm going to take the time to think, say, well, I know that if this misfire in cylinder number one is occurring, there's only, only so many things it could be. I could have a problem with the ignition, I could have a problem with the compression, or I could have a problem with fuel going in that cylinder, right? So that's the three basics right there. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to list these suspects, okay, for that misfire, ignition, compression, fuel. So I'm going to be able to go uh, next onto the next step and start testing to see which is which. Here's what I mean by step five, begin eliminating those suspects. Back to the misfire example. I can perform a test that will tell me about the integrity of the ignition system, can't I? I can perform a test that will tell me about the integrity of the cylinder, can't I? I can perform a test that will tell me about the integrity of the fuel system to that affected cylinder. But the thing I wanna do here is I wanna pick a testing method that's going to allow me to eliminate as many suspects right off the bat as possible. Um, for example, um, a relative compression test can tell me a whole lot very quickly uh, and it's a very quick test to make. Um, I could scope the ignition and see what the ignition pattern looks like. That can wipe out a whole lot of candidates uh, there alone. So pick a test no matter what kind of a situation you're troubleshooting, but think to yourself using all the information that you've learned so far of what you could do to eliminate as many of your potential suspects as possible. Now as your list gets smaller, then we're going to start doing more pinpoint tests to isolate one by one. Uh, what can I do a test on that's going to tell me for sure that, that this is not good and this is? You know, and, and you perform those pinpoint tests until finally you've got it narrowed down to one potential cause. 
Once you have it down to that one potential cause, do yourself a favor. One more test to verify that that is indeed the cause. Okay, once we have that cause identified, the next step's easy. We're going to go ahead and perform the repair. Uh, go ahead and take what we confirmed that we know is broken. We're going to fix that, and then we're going to verify by repeating those tests that that repair did indeed correct that problem. But then we have to go back to square one. We have to retest the entire system to ensure that there isn't a second or third cause, which there can be from time to time. So I don't want to just blindly say, okay, that's it. Turn the check engine light off, clear the code, send it back to the customer, only to have that customer come right back with another issue. Make sure that we uh, verify that we've repaired the problem we've identified, and then we've verified that there are no other causes for that problem. And then thirdly, I want to go back out and uh, make sure I get all the monitors reset so that I'm not bitten by something totally unrelated to the work I was doing today coming back only because that, that code had been suspended because of the other codes that were set in the system that they originally came in with. Follow me? So uh, if I come in with, say, uh, an oxygen center heater code, that's relatively simple, not a big deal. But as long as that code exists, that catalyst efficiency uh, monitor isn't going to run because the, the test can't verify or, or trust the results from the oxygen sensor. So once I fix that heater, I've got to make sure I run that catalyst monitor through to completion so I know for sure that there's not a problem with the catalytic converter or an efficiency code that's going to pop up and bite me in the butt. And that's just a very easy, very quick example. Again, when you look at these codes, you'll see as part of the description what other codes are going to be suspended uh, while that code is active or vice versa. Sometimes I'll list it where it's like, okay, when, when uh, this code will not be checked if this code, this code, this code is already set. So make sure you follow. That's all goes back to gathering the evidence. All right, so that's very quick. That's a very quick overview of the diagnostic process. This whole series, we've been building up our foundation for drivability diagnostics by starting with understanding how the ECM does what it does, what tools are available to us in global OBD2, and now we've gone over the diagnostic process. The next time we're going to get together, we're going to take a closer look at fuel trims. Fuel trims are not just about uh, tackling system lean and system rich codes. They can provide some very good diagnostic information and can be one of those general tests that we just talked about. So until next time, this is Pete Meyer, Motor Age Magazine. Thanks for watching.